by the pastor out there in Arkansas uh, was killed this afternoon. But anyway, it's uh, certainly a tragedy. But, you know, life is precious. But we shouldn't take it for granted. Amen. We all agree it's precious. All of us here. But, uh, you know, whenever she left her home about a quarter to two, she had no idea. You made a profession of faith about 10 years ago. And I'm not trying to, to sound mean, or, but my wife and I, since that time, have, have, have seriously doubted whether she was saved. <laughs> and that's the hard part about all of this. And, uh, and, uh, just, uh, not only was there, there no proof, I mean, just, just such turmoil in that home, and such so court involved all the time. I've been to court several times myself. You know, you you do you do all you can for a family and it just sometimes it just seems like it's for nothing. Well you don't always know why God is sending you to a certain person. Because there's certain numbers of others, you know, sons and, 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 and nephews and all that are, that are in jail. Share, share Christ, and uh, just just as as we were praying, I got a, a text from um, one of the girls in that family, 16 years old. She's been to church over and over. She's been with us at church camp. I don't know how many times, and we just pray, you know, God, you know, reach, reach up, Lord, you know, and, and that's the first time she's ever seen. So just, just be praying for the home and family. I'm, I'm sure I'll do the funeral or part of it. I'm, you know, maybe a few, but I don't know when. But uh, just be in prayer for that situation. It's a that be a building full of lost folks. I'm just gonna tell y'all. That's just that's just the this thing. And uh, so it's uh it's detracted from my frame of mind for tonight. But I'm gonna share some things from God's word anyway. So go to, to Genesis chapter 2. While you're turning there, and before I forget, because I don't say it now, I will forget. And I'll announce it again Monday, excuse me, Sunday morning. But as soon as service is over Sunday morning, I'm going to ask our men to be right down here. Just three minutes, two to three minutes, I'll be over. Just have something I want to share with our men. So that's Sunday morning. Thank you all for your, your prayers for, for me last uh, Wednesday evening through the night. Several of you contacted me the next day, and I, I appreciate it so very, very much. Um, I felt much, much better um, after after a night's rest and, and uh, everything. I haven't had any issues since, but I just want to just tell you how much I appreciate you um, praying for me. In, uh, and I can't speak out of Genesis 2 when I'm in 2 Peter 2, can I? We have completed, in the first chapter, we've completed the, the, the creation week. 
And so what we're entering now in chapter 2 is, is, is not necessarily God is going to give some details here of that creation week. But he's speaking to certain things. And as, as we said in, in, in chapter 1, uh, we, we talked about the importance of Genesis 1-1 and God establishing our, 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 his, his authority, pronouncing his, his authority at that point over all creation. We're going to see an actual step, um, a forward or step up, if you will, even of God himself in chapter 2 because we see a name of God for the very first time in Scripture in chapter 2. But we start off with something here that, that, that's important that, again, is not fully developed here but is partially developed for later on. Um, God does that many, many times in Scripture since we're starting Sunday night with, with, with a prophecy series, um, one of the things that, that we will see as we go forward in prophecy, prophecy sometimes has an initial fulfillment and then later on a completion. And we'll see that as we, we study through. Um, many times the, the partial fulfillment, again, it's, it, as it relates to, to the nation of Israel, is partial but will not be completed until you get to the literal millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But here in this passage, and one of the things that, that, that you need to keep in mind in our studies for the book of Genesis as throughout, but particularly um, as we go here forward, is what God's doing here for his chosen people, the nation of Israel. Now, before you say anything, you, you, you know, this does not mean that this is not for us, okay? But at this point, okay, remember, remember in the Old Testament, we had the right to the Jew first. God presents the Messiah through what? Through the nation of Israel. But God is presenting himself and his authority, his power and who he is, his majesty. Let's use that term. Here, he's laying this groundwork for the nation of Israel and for what they're going to be facing because of what he tells them to do later on in that what? To teach their generations, not just the fam the fa their family and the ones that, that they're accountable for right then and there, but generation after generation after generation. And of course, that certainly includes us today. And so what we're going to look at here in just a few moments is this, this comes together here in this second verse. But verse 1 of chapter 2 says, thus, thus, relating to the previous chapter and how he said that he did it in six literal days, <coughs> thus the heavens and the earth <coughs> were finished, and then we see this, this term, all the host of them. We see in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, where host refers there specifically to stars. But we also see in 1 Kings chapter 22, where it speaks specifically of angels, all right? So you say, well, which one does it mean here? It means both of them. All the host of heaven, everything of the heavens that God created, okay? Remember, initially, angels were created, okay, created. They're always created beings, but they were with God. They were around the throne of God. We read uh, here recently, we read a, a brief excerpt there from the book of Ezekiel that, that spoke of Lucifer as he was created and talking about his, his body and, and things of those nature and, and, and this, that, and the other. Again, they were around the throne of God. But it's something else to remember even now. Satan, okay, he's not in hell. We know that. But he still has access to the throne of God. Okay, We see that early in the book of Job. God says, Job, what you been up to? He says, I've been going about to and fro across the face of the earth. Okay? And that's when God says, have you considered my servant Job? Okay? But Satan still has access. He's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at one time. I literally had a lady from a, from a church years ago come to me and say, Brother Kyle, I don't care what the Bible says. He can be anywhere at any time. All the time. I said, that's not what the word of God says. Listen, folks. But he still has access. Why? What's the problem? Why would he want to accuse you. To accuse and slander you, God's child, before the throne of God. That's where he's going back and forth. Okay. All right. But here we have here, verse number two says, And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, 
and he rested on the seventh day from all work, his work which he made. Now, we see that here we are back to an English word, rested. Yeah. Um, you and I need to rest. We get out in the yard and, 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 and work and do all these different things. You know, you can only go so long. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right? Um, and, and, but, but God doesn't need to rest yeah. in that sense. This word here, rest, doesn't mean to, to sit down and, 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 and regroup the strength. It just simply means to cease. God ceased his work of the first six days. We talked about last time, we talked about the importance of this seventh day. Okay, now make sure we understand something. God at this point is not declaring this to be the Sabbath. Okay? That will come much later, several hundred years, about 1,485 years later, by the way, in Exodus chapter 20. All right? But he's not establishing the Sabbath at this point completely. Nowhere in here is instruction ever given to Adam on how to, how to worship in the sense of how he was to approach God or his sacrifices. Now listen, we know that he gave that instruction, but God did not tell him it had to be done on that day, or at least it's not recorded. Okay? Guess what? It's not recorded for Abraham. It's not recorded for Isaac. It's not recorded for Jacob. Again, many years later, it will be recorded. Now, just as a side note, before we get any further, take your Bible, hold your place here in Genesis chapter 2, and turn to the, to the let's just turn, just turn to Genesis chapter 11. And then I want you to look at how thin an area of pages you hold in your finger. Y'all see that? God's word, there's more time, calendar time, that takes place from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11 than all the rest of the Bible combined. Time wise. Kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? Okay. Remember, chapter, remember what happened in chapter 11? The title of Bible. Okay. So, just wanted to kind of give that, put that in, in perspective here. But going back to verse number 2 here, this word, this word, uh, he says that he rested, okay? Now, we, we're not going to turn there. You, you can jot this, jot this down if you like. But in Isaiah chapter 40, in verse 28, speaking of God, it says, it says where he fainteth, fainteth not, neither does need, need rest, okay? Never grows weary. Never grows weary. And we wouldn't expect him to. What kind of God would we serve if he, if he got tired? What kind, of God, what kind of God would we serve if, if we could only do a little bit at a time? No, we serve a, 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 an almighty God, amen, <laughs> um, that's able to, to do all things. But then we get into verse number three. It says, and God blessed the seventh day okay, and sanctified it. This word sanctified, again, has different meanings throughout the Hebrew, but it, it's a very, very, very important thing. But in context right here in this verse, it means that this day was lifted above all other days. Lifted above all of other days. Now I want you to think of something here for just a moment. We're prior to Genesis chapter 3. Okay? We're prior to that point. We know what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Okay? We have a fall in the garden. Okay? But we also have something else that takes place in that chapter, which, by the way, he's resting here. And there's nothing else that's recorded that he does in work until Genesis chapter 3. And I'm not talking about the curse. I'm talking about something he specifically does with animals. And that's when the innocent blood of animals is shed in Genesis chapter 3. Remember whenever God called upon in the garden what they had used for clothing? Fig leaf. God had to teach them something, teach us something when he shed blood of animals, okay? We don't know what kind. Could have well been sheep. We don't know. But God taught them in there that blood must be shed for the remission of sins, okay? So in between this point and that, God doesn't do any actual work that's recorded. Okay? We'll, just, we'll just say that point. Okay. But verse number three says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. 
again, at this point, it will be actually in Exodus 16 before it's mentioned again. It will be done in Exodus chapter 20. Okay? But we don't see that word Sabbath in that sense of rest or as under the Mosaic law. All right? But at the same time, at the same time, God still sets this day apart in their minds, okay? And it's also, as we've said before, it's also set forth the pattern for the week, okay? We, we still have a seven-day week, okay, on our calendar. Not a five-day, not a ten-day, okay? But for the, for the Jewish people, he's setting forth this pattern at this point. He says, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Verse 4 says, these are the generations. Um, the, this, this, word, this word generations here is, is, the, is the, shall we say, the root of where we get the word Genesis. So these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day, and then here it is, Lord God. Lord, you want to underline this or make a note? And here we have for the first time in Scripture, Yahweh. Yahweh in in the in the, um, in, the he, in the Hebrew here um, again the the the, uh, the spelling here is Y H W H Y H W H first time in Scripture um, it says when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens verse five says and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it, before it grew and see that little phrase before it grew we've already talked about here that in creation again the plants as, as they were created as God spoke them into being again that they were full maturity on, on the earth at that point here um, before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it they literally allowed it to process had not caused it to rain upon the earth. Okay? Remember, at this point, there was no rain. We talked about the firmament earlier in chapter 1. We talked about the canopy there and, and all that was in, included in that. And God used that to water the earth. Right? Um, it says it was in the earth and every earth field before it grew. Uh, God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Okay, so this, this here is going back before actually the days before Adam, but then watch what happens. Verse 6 says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. We talked about the importance of that term. Whole face meaning what? That the entire earth was inhabitable. Um, and all that process is here. That word, this word mist here, again, this is not in the sense of, 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 of like a little mist of rain or if you, you'll see people watering um, gardens or watering plants and they'll have this little setting on their hose and you see this little mist come up. That's not what this is talking about at all. This refers to the water vapor. Again, back to the, the canopy over the earth. We have a reminder of that water canopy even now. Starts with a D. But it would have been more significant at this point here, again, in the watering of plants as it moves forward. Um, verse 7. We see the word Yahweh here again. I'm going to have you turn in your Bible to uh, hold your place. And let's go to Psalm 139. Because we want to let's let's look here at something that's very, very significant in this in this passage. Psalm 139. place there in Psalm 139. Let me read Genesis 2 7. It says and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, as we look at this verse here, 
our thought process, we just, we just, you know, we dust the ground. It's just kind of just some dust. But this word dust means elements of the earth. Um, somebody perhaps will know the answer to this question. Um, you've heard, shall we say, what the value of a human being's body is after death as far as the elements that are inside in the body. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's less than a dollar, isn't it? Ninety-something cents, that's it. whatever it is. But that's speaking directly about the elements, okay, minerals, different things that are in the ground that God here again formed. This word form here, we, we, we've already already seen some of this earlier, but here we have here we have the, the, the first direct, shall we say, teaching. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this. He says what? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, as, he, as he's speaking to his disciples there, we know that what? He's talking about our home, our future home, okay? In heaven, our dwelling place, okay? We, what we refer to as mansion, okay? There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. That's the word used, but it means specific dwelling place, okay? Ben, how big your, your, your dwelling place in heaven, you reckon? How big is your dwelling place in heaven, you reckon? You don't know? I'm talking about your specific place. Now, we're backwards with one of those things I told you. When I don't know, I don't know. I don't know why we need one. I really don't. But the Bible clearly teaches that there's going to be a specific spot. It will not be, hold on right here. It, well, I'm not talking about here, well, when you get there, well, let's just kind of wander. You go kind of down that road there and find you a place. And you, that's your word. No. That's not what scripture teaches in John chapter 14. This word prepared means that what? With the hand of God, with his own hands, he is making a place that you will spend eternity in forever and ever and ever. Listen, I've known some good house builders in my One of the fellows from down there in, in Goodwill, Louisiana, James Hayes, one of the best ever. Okay. I went to work for him whenever I was, was young, off and on, okay? When you pull that tape measure and you cut that board, 16 falls ain't good enough. You hear me? And he was a picky carpenter. Because you're going you gonna, you gonna to go back and you're going to cut it again. And it better be perfect. If he wants, if he wants a two and four that's, uh, that's, that's 18 and 5 eighths, it had better be exactly 18 and 5 eighths. When I first started working with him, it was kind of a Issue. But you know what? God was teaching me something because he was a preacher too. And he'd sit down with me at lunch. This was just as I was had, had, had surrendered to preach, and actually just before, but he was teaching me how specific the word of God is. Folks, there's no such thing as close enough theology. It's exactly and precisely as God presents it. Period. And he was teaching me those things. And in this passage, we're going to come back to that here in just a minute. But John chapter 4, this place, I talked about, we talked about the specific love that God has for us in our, by names. That's how God <coughs> knows the number of hairs that are on our head. Everything about us is an individual, okay, because of a precious love that he has for us. And this is what he's talking about. He loves us enough that he made a place for me, not just a certain, just that, that's your place, but no. It's going to be a personalized place in heaven that I'm going to stay in forever and ever and ever by his own hand. Okay? But here we have in Psalm, Psalm 139, verse 15. Make sure I'm where I'm supposed to be. Here the psalmist says, my substance. What's he talking about? He's talking about the elements. He's literally talking about the things in which God Made him with. Made him by. So you see in these passages and many, many, many others, it continues to get what? More specific, more specific, more specific. You by name. Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood for our individual sins. All of them. For our entire lifetime. God knew when he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on his cross. He knew how many sins that we would have. Amen? All of them. 
Every single one. God never told his son Jesus Christ that what? You know what? There's just some areas of this individual life. Don't waste your blood on that. Okay? Just, just some of them. No. He died for every single sin that I ever committed. Amen? Amen. So it's continually over and over and over an emphasis here on a specific love. Um, let me just ask y'all a question. What would you think of me if I told you, you know what, I love you, but not all the time? <coughs> you wouldn't think much of me, would you? Amen? Yeah. Okay. God never says that. God never says, you know what, I love you, but there's just some things I'm not going to let go of. There's just some things I'm not going to forgive you for. You know what? That's just not as sweet, is it? Is a perfect love, is a perfect forgiveness. I got news for you. Now, now hang with me here. There's things in my life I don't deserve to be forgiven for. Amen. And then when we, we might think that that's okay, but we better think the next part of that. <laughs> I got a message that I've, that I've never preached. I've got it on in a notebook had for years. What is this things that the angels don't know? Maybe one of these days I'll preach it here. God gives me an opportunity. But you know, one of the things that the angels don't know is what? They don't know the joy of forgiveness. They don't know. There's never a point where a, a, an angel is forgiven of their sin. Okay? They were sealed immediately after that sin. Those that sinned, of course, failed with Satan. But even the righteous angels that, that never sinned before God, they don't know the joy of forgiveness. The Bible teaches us that they are watching. Okay? We'll get into this at another point, another time. But even your studies, particularly in the FBI, I'm sure Brother John covered this. But the Bible teaches that the angels are standing in awe of you as God's children. Because why? Because you worship he that you've never seen. <clears throat> our Lord and our Savior, there's nobody in this room that's ever seen him. But yet by faith, we've given our heart to him. By faith, we've given our life to him. That, John 3, 16 says, For, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, that word believeth means put complete trust in. And to an angel, okay, though they have a mind that's, that's so much shall we say, uh, in, in the sense of, of, of being smarter than us, more intelligent, all this, that's something that they cannot really comprehend. They stand in awe of us. Okay? That's one of the reasons why God commanded that we not worship angels. Okay? Angels will serve us to heaven, folks. Yeah. All right. But as we see this, we start in verse number 15. The, the, the psalmist here says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Okay. We see later on in, in, in the book of Jeremiah, again, where God says there, it says, before I was born, before I formed thee, before I ever formed thee, I bet my mother knew I knew thee. Constantly, over and over and over, God reaffirmed this. Here the psalm says, my substance was not, he knew who he wanted. He knew he what you wanted to be. He had a will for your life, a perfect will for your life before you were ever born, but more so than that, he had a plan to save your soul, okay, for you to spend eternity with him in heaven. So you mean to tell me, whatever your name is there, you mean to tell me that during creation week and, and, and even going all back to this folk, that God knew my name? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Again, it says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Again, another reference here, this lowest parts, again, to the, to, the, to, the, um, to, the, to the elements, to the minerals, and all these type things. So let's turn back, Genesis chapter 2. I'm getting close to as far as I want to go tonight. But we're in verse number 7, still. It says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Now I want you to think about that. As he reached down and shaped Adam. Earlier we had already seen where God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as he spoke of there, is making him in our own image. And as God literally, okay, this is literal, folks. 
This is this is this is uh, this is not allegory or some of those other terms that these liberals come up with. But this is literally God bending down and shaping on, on top of the earth and shaping Adam. Okay? Now watch this. Watch this right here. It says, and breathe into his. Okay, so, so we kind of have a misconception there. Hold on. And breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. This song, we're going to go back to the book of Psalms here. Just a so God is, has shaped Adam at this point. That he breathes the breath of life into him. He gave him life. Now we'll just stop there for just a moment. Have you ever, if, again, if, 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 this, this is worship, folks. This is humbling ourselves before a holy God. You realize that literally as you're sitting where you're sitting, as you leave here and go outside this building, wherever you are, as you intake oxygen into your lungs, you're doing so by the permission of the Holy God. He is allowing you to breathe his air. He has made your body so that you take in this air. Okay, it's his. This is by direct creation. And God here, here we go again. Another principle here is being introduced for the first time in Scripture. And I'm just going to follow it up with two. Just with two. Hold in your place here. We'll come back and read this again as we finish. But let's go to the book of Psalms. The 33rd Psalm. Psalm 33. Verse number six. It's by, it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. That's what we've talked, what we've been looking at the whole time in, in, in the first week. Okay? God spoke this world into existence in six little days. Okay? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts. That's what we started out with in the very first verse tonight. Okay? All the host of them, but then we look at this next word. By the what? Breath of his mouth. Now, we're going to see where this, this, this significance comes to in this next passage. Okay? But it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll turn there. Some of you, even as I said that, already know what I'm about to read. But I want us to look at the emphasis here on breathe, breath, God's breath, God breathe. Verse 16, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Earlier we saw where Adam, where God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. Okay. <clears throat> we just saw here again that, 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 that in, in uh, Psalm 33, we saw that by the word of God were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And we need to look at this here in this sense here is, 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 is by his authority. Then we get to verse number 16. All scripture. Now if you believe the word of God, you don't have any problem in, in knowing what that means. That means all scripture. That means everything from Genesis 1-1 all the way through the book of Revelation and everything in it. It says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But as we look at the first part of this, this verse here, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know this. It means God breathed in it. I, uh, listen, I realize, I, I understand, you know, you, you, you have different people that talk about, you know, different writers and, and having different styles, you know. Apostle Paul had this certain style. And Timothy had a certain style. All this stuff, no. I'm going to tell you something. We need to be 
be careful in those areas. As we attribute a teaching to the Apostle Paul, okay? yes, it may be in a book that he was, that shall we say, that he was holding the pen, but we need to understand something. It's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing the writing. Amen. Okay? Not just a book here and there, but every single word. Okay? Now, when I say that, in some people's mind, okay, and I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself, but I ain't going to plant this in. Some people say, well, you got this version of the Bible, and you got this, and you got that. If, 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 if every word is God, what, what do we do to that? Well, that's coming down the line as we, as we look at as we look at different Greek texts and who wrote the Greek text. Okay, that's coming down the line. But the bottom line is this. God wrote this book. If God had didn't write all of it, then that means that the parts that he did not write are without authority. And don't carry the same weight. Amen. Isn't that spiritually and scripturally logical? Okay. All of it. It says right here, all scripture. God breathed. We see God breathing life in Adam. Okay. We see God breathing in the sense creation in the life. But we also see what he is the breath of life. The bread of life, excuse me. Jesus told Satan on that mountain, Matthew chapter 1 says, what man doesn't live by doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. By the word of God is done. God is building foundations. We've seen over and over and over, and we're only in the seventh verse of chapter two. Is God is declaring His majesty, His power. What do we see in the, in the book of Revelation? We see a passage there again that begins to what? Is heaven is, is, is searched for for he that is worthy. Hey, folks. God is worthy of our worship. Amen. God is worthy of our service, service and our servant's heart. Certainly, we get further in Scripture, and God teaches us more and more and more and more and more and more. But without these foundations, we'll never understand spiritually what Paul is talking about in the sense of dying to self, or further, as we spiritually mature, one of the most important principles of all Christianity in what? God bought us with a price. He paid a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid that price for us. You know what? I don't blame you. What I mean by that is, is God says, go, I go. So if you're a preacher, no, that's for you too. When God tells us we need to do something, we need to do something. When God commands us, how many commands, shall we say, um, in, 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 this, in the Word of God are we, are we uh, subject to? What percentage do you think? 100%. That's what I'm talking about. But this is, here's where it all changes. Here's where it all changes. Here's where we have victory in our Christian life. We can know that we're subject, but it's how we serve him. <clears throat> Do we serve him because we're, well, we're supposed to? Because we're supposed to? Do we serve him because we have to? Or do we serve him? Well, it's just expected to. Or do we wake up, shall we say, with a love in our heart and say, I serve him because he first loved me? Serving him out of love will change your life. You say, but that just happens automatically to every Christian. Oh, no, it doesn't. Oh, no, it doesn't. You see, serving Christ with that kind of heart, okay, it's a choice. It's a choice. We can hold back our life. We can say no to God and the things that he leads us in. We can run from him. I believe I can, I can, well, I know I can take you there if, if I can get to that street. But I can take you to the place, okay, and the house in New Jersey of all places where God called me to preach in September of 1980. I can tell that story in a time, but I can, take, I can take you to that place. I just shared this with, with a young man this past May. He had no idea that his mom was the one that set that trip up and said, now 40 years later, 
Only two years later, one year later, he was able to call his mom and say, Mom, by the way, I'm here to preach to you. God called me to preach right there. 